Hello, everyone, and welcome to our fourth day of the colloquium. This is our third session for today. Um, again, it's one of our evening sessions, which was requested by our faculty to have um, some later in the day options, um, because sometimes they can't attend during the day when they're at work and they wanted to do it once they got home. So anyway, we have Dr. Shireen Cassie, and she is uh, presenting some research uh, for us uh, today related to an event that has a sort of impacted all of us, um, which is the pandemic. And if you have uh, children who were in high school um, or even any you know, grade level, you also were impacted and you probably got to experience on the front end firsthand of even the student experience on how the school systems and teachers had to adjust all of a sudden to an online modality, some with different skill sets on how familiar they were with online technology. And in a very rapid period of time, because of the pandemic and shutting down schools and so forth, a bunch of teachers and students had to move to an online uh, format. And so Dr. Cassie has done research in that area to examine um, what were their perspectives during that time period, the teachers who had to go through that, um, and what can we learn from that in case it ever happens again, right, or layers of this where sometimes maybe a school only has to be shut down for a month or so because something happens, and it's not as disruptive um, because we've learned from some of the research that Dr. Cassie has to say. So, um, Shireen, I'll get out of the way and just let you take over. Thank you for the introduction. So my name is Shireen Cassie. It's Thursday, March 17th, 2022. So I have completed my PhD in Educational Technology and Leadership Program at Concordia University, Chicago in October of 2021. And what I'm presenting today is my dissertation research study, which is titled Perspectives of High School Teachers Toward Online Learning During the COVID-19 Pandemic. So building closures and the suspension of in-person and face-to-face -face instruction due to COVID-19 in the spring of 2020 forced us to swiftly transition to an unplanned and unprepared online learning. Many schools were unprepared to deliver the instruction exclusively in an online environment. Although many schools have worked so hard to ensure the continuity of learning, research shows that these efforts are not likely to provide the quality of education that is delivered in a face-to-face -face setting in the classroom. According to many researchers, this sudden transition to exclusively online learning has been criticized for not providing the quality of education delivered in the classroom. And one of the main limitations and challenges of online learning during the pandemic was the lack of interactivity and engagement and motivation of students, which was related to the loss of the human interactions between teachers and students, as well as among students. And at the same time, this transition to online learning has also stimulated innovations that may change the education system forever. So my study will seek to address the problem of the lack of exploration into the effectiveness of online learning during COVID based on teachers' perceptions of their online learning experiences during the pandemic. Gaining a deeper understanding of how teachers perceive the effectiveness of online learning during the pandemic is vital because effective and meaningful collaboration and communication are unlikely to occur without a teacher's direction. Their perspectives may help develop instructional practices that build a sense of community in an online learning environment that positively affects students' learning, engagement, and motivation. According to Williams, 
K-12 education will continue to face challenges resulting from the pandemic. Thus, examining the effectiveness of online learning practices during the pandemic is important. This is important for school district leaders and policymakers who are dealing with this increasingly dynamic learning environments, regardless of the outcome of the pandemic. Research that explores the effectiveness of online learning at the high school level based on teachers' perceptions during the COVID is limited, which makes this study research important. Providing the research results to teachers, instructional designers, district leaders, and policymakers may contribute to the enrichment and understanding of online education and how to best prepare teachers for teaching in an online learning environment. So a little introduction about myself. So when I started in education, I did see the potential of technology in the classroom. And that's what led me to pursuing my PhD in educational technology leadership. Throughout my more than 10 years of working in the information and educational technology fields in public and private school districts, I have supported and led reform and change efforts related to technology practices in a variety of educational settings. I have also supported schools in designing digital learning environments necessary for developing the 21st century skills required for our students to compete in an increasingly digital and global marketplace. I'm currently employed at the county level as a project manager, serving 23 school districts with more than 500 schools on preparing new and prospective school leaders and educational administrators for the increased challenges of 21st century educational leadership, including educational technology and online learning. As an educational technology expert, I have experienced firsthand during the past two years how dramatic advances in technology have affected our organizations during the COVID-19 pandemic. This study developed from a desire to understand perceptions of the effectiveness of online learning across high school education to assist educational leaders and policymakers in making the right decisions regarding the implementation of online learning that will help develop transformed instructional models and new educational practices post-COVID across high school education in the United States. This research study took place within a public K-12 school district where I was formerly employed at one of its largest comprehensive high school as an educational technology specialist. My role at this public high school involved designing, implementing, evaluating, and managing technology programs and providing professional development to administrators and teachers on the use of technology and integrate technology in the classroom. I am very passionate about online learning in education and help make it equitable and accessible to all students. So the theoretical framework that I used is the community of inquiry framework developed by Garrison, Anderson, and Archer. This framework is based on a model of critical thinking and practice inquiry that assumes effective online learning requires the development of a community of learners that supports meaningful inquiry and deep learning through the complex dynamics of interactions within the course. The community of inquiry theory will be used as a guide to better understand the importance of interactions between all learners. This framework is one of the most referenced 
theories in online education and one of the most widely used frameworks for building online community. It was cited in the literature over 4,000 times, explaining online learner as an open, collaborative, and flexible learning process. Research showed that community building in an online learning environment has positive effects on student learning, engagement, and motivation. This framework is rooted in Vygotsky's social constructivism theory, which supports deeper understanding of content when individuals learn with others. So the figure on the left, it presents the community of inquiry framework, which considers how the three presences, teaching, cog the teaching, the social, and the cognitive, how they interact with each other, and how such interactions result in effective online learning experiences. It is at the intersections of the three presences that effective learner effective learning takes place. In this study, the online experiences of teachers were explored using this framework, the community of inquiry framework. So this model serves as the framework for evaluating deep learning through the development of three primary interconnected overlapping forms of presence in an online learning environment which are the cognitive presence, social presence, and teaching presence. So according to Garrison, the cognitive presence refers to understanding based on collaboration and reflective thinking through exploration, integration, and application of new ideas. Social presence is the ability to establish personal, and purposeful relationship through effective expression, open communication, and group cohesion. Whereas teaching presence supports both the cognitive and the social through the teacher's design, facilitation, and direct instruction. So the purpose of this study is to examine and compare the perceptions of high school teachers toward online learning during the COVID-19 in the remote and virtual online learning programs at a public K-12 school district in Southern California, based on the existence of the three forms of presence of the community of inquiry framework, the social, the cognitive, and the teaching. So at the beginning of the 2021 school year, the district that is included in this study provided the families with two different online learning programs, the remote and the virtual. And a key difference between the remote and the virtual learning program is the way the curriculum is developed. So the teachers who are teaching in the remote, they design and develop and manage their own content for, for their online classes. And they use a learning management system to house all the materials. This learning management system, it serves as the course content and the, it's the communication hub between the teachers, students, and among students themselves. These teachers developed online courses. They provide a space for students and teachers to collaborate with each other. And it allows teachers to grade assignments and provide feedback for students. The remote learning program, it provides more teacher and student interactions through synchronous online activities than the virtual learning programs. Teachers in the remote, they require students to attend synchronous online sessions, whereas teachers in the virtual, they do not. So overall, the number and the length of these sessions is geared more towards students learning in the remote learning program than the virtual program. Whereas teachers in the virtual program, they use a purchased vendor developed online courses that offer pre-designed instructional videos and prepared that are prepared by um, 
licensed educators, as well as, as it has online lessons and assignments and assessments. So all these vendor developed online courses, they provide the lessons and grade the assignments. And students, they just work independently and asynchronously. So in general, the virtual program is a student-led and self-paced learning model that primarily involves students who experience fewer interactions with the teacher and other classmates than the remote. And as of the date of that research, which was conducted in the spring of 2021, all the teachers and students in both learning programs have been exclusively utilizing online learning since the pandemic started in uh, March. So in this slide, I will talk briefly about the literature in three main topics. So the first one is the effectiveness of online learning pre-COVID and the ineffectiveness of online learning during COVID and the effectiveness of online learning during COVID-19. So I will start by the effectiveness of online learning in the K-12 education, so pre-COVID. So pre-COVID, research on the K-12 online learning have provided evidence that online teaching and learning is effective when it is carefully and thoughtfully designed. Many researchers examined the effectiveness of online learning in, the, in regards of cognitive presence and student content interaction. For example, in a study conducted by Curry and Turners, the study showed that students were more deeply engaged with the material and they were more enthusiastic and motivated when they were presented with authentic learning opportunities as they felt an increased sense of ownership of the topic. So in regards to social interactions in online learning, Borup and others explored the perceptions of students taking online courses. The study showed that there, were, there was a significant correlation between students' grades and the overall time spent on student-student interaction. Brought up further, he explored the importance of these interactions in online learning from the teacher's perceptions. And the study showed that teachers, they largely valued students' social interaction as a way for students to feel motivated and socially integrated into their online learning environment. In regards to teaching presence, which is the student-teacher interaction, many researchers argued that teaching presence sets the tone for the whole learning experience and plays the most fundamental role in online learning. For example, Borup and others found that the main reason for a successful learning outcome were the considerable time teachers spend tutoring and interacting with their students and the effective strategies teachers use to motivate their students. So the research on the ineffectiveness of online learning during COVID crisis, as indicated by many researchers, was that online learning has been criticized for its ineffectiveness when it was compared to the traditional face-to-face -face learning. One of the main limitations for online learning during the pandemic was the lack of interactivity and motivation of students. Definitely, our education system was unprepared when forced to deliver instruction exclusively online. However, despite all the challenges faced by this sudden transition to online learning, Frederick, um, and others, they argued that the shift to teaching and learning online opened many possibilities that were untapped pre-COVID by most teachers and students. 
which may lead to lasting change. So um, these are the three research questions and hypotheses that guided my study. So the first question was, to what extent are there differences in teachers' perceptions of the teaching presence between the remote and virtual learning program? And the alternative hypothesis for this research question states that there is a statistically significant difference in teachers' perceptions. And the null hypothesis states that there is no statistically significant difference in teacher's perception. The second research question is, to what extent are there differences in teacher's perceptions of the social presence between the remote and the virtual learning program? And I listed the alternative and the null hypothesis. Whereas the third research question was, to what extent are there differences in teachers' perceptions of the cognitive presence between the remote and the virtual learning program? So my research design, a quantitative research study was designed to collect data and test the research hypothesis and determine whether there is a statistically significant difference in teachers' perceptions. In this study, a cross-sectional survey research design was used to collect quantitative data. And these are the characteristics of this. I'm not going to go over them now. So um, the setting for this research took place at one of the top 10 largest K-12 public school districts located in urban Southern California serving a diverse student population of approximately 53,000 students in 51 schools. The district schools include 29 elementary, 3K to 8 academics, and 8 intermediate and 9 high schools. The study population comprised all the high school teachers at the 9 high schools within the district, which equal 682 teachers. Among those high school teachers, 531 teachers teach in the remote online program and 151 teachers in the virtual online learning program. I chose to purposefully include the entire population of high school teachers at the nine high schools within the district to obtain a good representation of the study population. And I also wanted to give every teacher an equal opportunity to share their own online learning experiences during the pandemic. So my data collection was an online questionnaire which with closed ended statements. And it consisted of two parts. So the first part had four closed-ended multiple choice demographic questions about the teachers, such as the learning program they're teaching in, what grades are they teaching, the years of teaching experience, and uh, the subject they teach. The second part of the survey has the 34 modified statements to measure the existence of the three presences from the teacher's perspective. So the original 34 statements of the community of inquiry survey, it measures the existence of the three presences from the students' perspectives. However, multiple researchers have modified it from the student point of view to that of the teacher. And these statements were all rated on a five point Likert scale to which teacher indicated their level of agreement with the statements by choosing one for the choice, by choosing five for strongly agree and one for strongly disagree. This community of inquiry instrument is a valid, reliable and efficient measure of the dimensions of teaching, social and cognitive presence in a variety of disciplines and educational settings. And it is the most frequently used and the one adopted most commonly in the literature. So part two of this survey will start by asking the question, 
How do you rate your online teaching experiences during the COVID-19 pandemic with the following? And following that question comes all the 34 modified statements from the three presences. So the first 13 statements are the teaching present statements. And these statements will help answer the research question one. An example of those statements is like, overall, I help to keep course participants engaged and participating in productive dialogue. Now, the second nine statements are the social presence statements and will help answer research question two. And the last 12 statements are the cognitive present statements and will help answer research question three. So data collection, I collected the data during the summer of 2020 after all teachers within the school district were utilizing online learning for over a year due to the closure of school building during pa the COVID pandemic. I developed the online survey using SurveyMonkey and after I ob obtained the IRB approvals from the school district and the university, I contacted the principals of the nine high schools within the district by email, and I asked them to forward the teacher's invitation to participate email directly to their teachers, where I included the informed consent letter and the link to the survey. And I kept the survey open for two months. The survey was sent to all 682 high school teachers and I hoped for a response rate of at least 50% from the teachers in each learning program. So in order for me to attain such a high response, I sent a follow-up email with the link to the questionnaire asking the principal to remind their teachers to complete the survey before the due date. I sent it three times throughout the period of two months. However, I, uh, due to the like extraordinary circumstances and the stressful nature of online teaching during the pandemic, the response return rate for the population size of 682 was 14%, which is a total of 96 responses. 72 of those teachers were in the remote program, which is 14%, and 24 were um, teaching in the virtual learning programs. So um, should I keep going, Dr. Kevin, or do we have any questions, feedback, and conversations? I, I say keep going, um, and then we can save those kinds of things towards the end where we'll open it up a little bit, and then you and I can have a conversation and anybody else that shows up you know, uh, on the session. But at this point, I don't see anything in the chat and I'm following along perfectly. I'm enjoying this presentation. This is my area of interest, you know, online education. Perfect, so I'll keep going. So now my data analysis. So after I closed the online survey, I exported the raw data from the survey to Monkey to a protected Excel spreadsheet. And a total of 128, survey responses were collected from the survey. So I cleaned the data and removed all the incomplete survey responses, which ended up with a final 96 responses. Then the Excel file was then imported to the SPSS to calculate the descriptive and the inferential statistics. Data analysis for this study included six steps. And in the next slides, I will be discussing these steps in more like details. So the first step was the participants were grouped and then demographic profiles were created. Means and standard deviations were calculated. Reliability estimates were calculated. Assumptions were tested before performing independent t-tests and then independent t-tests were performed. So the first step in the data analysis was grouping the participants. The survey's first question was, are you currently a teacher in the remote or virtual learning program? And of the 96 final responses, as illustrated in the pie chart, 
75% of the teachers were in the remote and 25% of the teachers were teaching in the virtual learning program. Now, the second step in the data analysis was creating the demographic profile of the teachers in each group and calculating descriptive statistics. The survey's second question was, what grades do you teach? And it has four choices to choose from. 9, 10, 11, and 12, where the participants, they can check all that applied. So that's why I use this clustered column charts that illustrates the grade type across remote and virtual. The reported data shows a good representation of all grades at the remote and the virtual learning program. So the survey's third question was, how many years of teaching experience do you have? And as illustrated in these pie charts, the reported data also shows a good representation of all years of experience at the remote and virtual programs. And then the fourth question was, what subjects is your primary assignment? And as illustrated in this pie charts, the reported data shows representation of a wide range of disciplines and greater representation in the remote than at the virtual learning program. So the third step in the data analysis was calculating the means and standard deviations for the 34 items of the community of inquiry survey data. The line graph shows that overall teachers in the remote, which is the blue line, reported an overall higher level of agreement regarding the existence of the 34 community of inquiry statements. These results indicate that teachers providing instructions in the remote are more likely to perceive a stronger sense of community of inquiry than the teachers providing instructions in the virtual. I also calculated the means and the standard deviation for the three presences as presented in this table. And this line graph shows that teachers in the remote program, which is the blue line, reported an overall higher level of agreement regarding the existence of the three presences, whereas teaching presence was perceived the highest and social presence which is the one in the middle, perceived the lowest for both programs. Now, the fourth step in the data analysis was creating the reliability estimates, or it's called internal consistency. For each of the three presences, I use Cromba's alpha. So um, in SPSS, a higher value of Cromba's alpha are better. So a widely accepted cutoff is 0.7 or higher to yield a good level of internal consistency. This table shows that the, commute, the um, computed Cromba's alpha for the three presences for this study and those reported by the author. So here's the Cromba's alpha by the authors of the um, original instrument and my current study, this is the Cromba's alpha. And the Cromba's for the three presences exceeded the 0.7, which is a high level of internal consistency. So now the fifth step in the data analysis was testing assumptions before performing independent sample t-tests to ensure that the data can actually be analyzed using independent t-tests and provide a valid result. So there are six assumptions that were tested. The first one is um, to have a continuous dependent variable. So the survey instruments utilize a five point Likert type scale. So it was met, the first assumption. So the second assumption is to have one independent variable that is categorical with two groups. 
So the independent variable, which is the learning program, was categorical and it comprised two groups, which is the remote and the virtual. So the second assumption was made. And the third assumption that was also made was to have independence of observations. And this was met in each group. There was a different, there was different participants with no participants being in more than one group. So assumption number four states that there should be no significant outliers in the two groups of the independent variable in terms of the dependent variable. And based on these box plots performed in SPSS, although not extreme, outliers did exist in teaching presence and social and cognitive presence. For teaching presence, there were four outliers, and for cognitive presence, there were three. So to deal with these outliers, I decided to evaluate whether the outliers have an effect on my analysis. So I ran the independent t-test with outliers, and then I removed the outliers in the teaching and cognitive and ran the t-test again. So this table presents the results with outliers and without outliers. So when I compared the results, I found that the statistically significant difference results were different for teaching at a P level less than 0.05. So I decided to remove the four outliers from the teaching presence. And for the social presence, we didn't have outliers in the data, so no data points were removed. But for cognitive presence, the analysis of independent t-test with and without, um, they were, were the same. So yeah, they were the same. So I decided to keep the outliers for the cognitive presence as the p-value for both values were less than 0.05. So assumption five says that the dependent variable should be approximately normally distributed for each group of the independent variable. So based on the Shapiro test that was run in SPSS, of P greater than 0.05, the three forms of presence for each level of learning program were all normally distributed. So for assumption number six is to have homogeneity of variances, which states that the population variance for each group of the independent variable is the same. So based on the Levine's test for equality of variances, which I used to test the, this assumption, teaching presence has violated the assumption of homogeneity at a p equal 0 0.024, which is less than the p value of 0 0.05. So the homogeneity of variances for both social and cognitive were found, except for the teaching presence. So since the t-test requires that the assumption of homogeneity of variances is met, and in order to proceed with the test, uh, despite that teaching presence violated that assumption, I did a modification to the standard t-test to accommodate the unequal uh, uh, variances and still deliver a valid t-test. So this modified test is called the Walsh test. So when I run the t-test, the SPSS produced this output, output that shows two row of t-test results. So the first one, when assumptions are met, and the second one, we, we use, I use the number when assumptions were not met, which is the case in the teaching presence. So after all the assumptions were tested before performing the independent t-test, my sixth step in the data analysis was performing the independent sample to help answer the three research questions and determine if there is a statistically significant difference existed in teachers' perceptions regarding the existence of the three presences. 
So based on the mean values in this table for teaching presence, the mean value for the remote was higher than that of the virtual. And the mean difference between these two groups was statistically significant at a p-value of 0.003, which is less than the 0.05. And for the social presence, the mean value was higher in the remote than in the virtual. However, the mean difference was not statistically significant between the two groups at a p-value 0.06. 406, which is greater than 0.04. And for the cognitive presence, the mean value for the remote was higher than the mean value for the virtual. And the mean differences between these two groups was statistically significant at a p-value 0.005, which is less than 0.05. So for research question one, which was, to what extent are there differences in teachers' perceptions of the teaching presence between the remote and virtual learning program? And statements 1 through 13 in the survey used to measure the existence of the teaching presence. Teachers in both learning programs, the remote and the virtual, reported the highest level of agreement with the existence of teaching presence more than the social and the cognitive. It could be determined that both groups of teachers found teaching presence to be essential in teaching online. An examination of the means for each of the 13 teaching presence survey statements for both learning program all revealed positive scores with no mean score below the midpoint score of 3.0. Teachers in the remote, they reported a statistically significant higher level of agreement regarding the existence of the teaching presence than those in the virtual. And because a statistically significant difference was found between means for teaching presence at a P less than 0.05, we can reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis for this research question. So, um, in order to answer research question one, yes, there is a statistically significant difference in teachers' perceptions of the teaching presence between the remote and virtual learning program. And because a statistically significant difference was found between means for teaching presence, this finding suggests that the two groups of teachers in this study were not in agreement in their perceptions of the existence of teaching presence in their online learning courses. And this is due to the development of online courses where teachers in the remote provide a space for collaboration and interaction. And students do engage between their teachers and between each other. Whereas the virtual program is a student-led self-paced model that has primarily involved students in which they just work independently and in asynchronously with less interactions with their teachers and their peers. Teachers with more synchronous interactions with their students, they had higher perceived teachers teaching presence. The strategies that teachers use in the remote program where they used to design the content of their online courses, engage students with course materials and facilitate live interactions and discussions within their courses does impact their perceived teaching presence. So for research question two, which was to what extent are there differences in teachers' perceptions of the social presence between the remote and learning program? Teachers in both learning programs reported the lowest level of agreement with the existence of social presence. And based on these findings, we can determine that both groups of teachers were perceiving some transactional distance in their online courses and less sense of social presence. 
The means for each of the nine social presence survey statements revealed means scores below the midpoint, which is 3.0 for both learning programs. In this study, teachers in the remote, they reported a slightly higher, but not a statistically significant level of agreement regarding the existence of the social presence than those in the virtual. And because a statistically significant difference was not found between the means of the social presence at a P level bigger than greater than 0.05, we can accept the null hypothesis and reject the alternative hypothesis. So to answer this research question, yes, there is that I mean, no, there is no statistically significant difference in teachers' perceptions of the social presence between the two learning programs. And because a statistically significant difference was not found between means for social presence, this finding suggests that the two groups of teachers in this study were in agreement in their perceptions of the level of the existence of the social presence in their online courses. And this result could be due to the um, circumstances during the COVID-19 crisis, which led to a sudden transition to exclusively online learning, which hindered many teachers from taking the full advantage of the potential of online learning, such as community building that could have improved the engagement and interactions between students. So it is possible that teachers in the virtual experience more transactional distance and less social presence than teachers in the remote. And again, this is due to the development of online courses in the remote program that provides a space for teachers and students to interact and engage through synchronous online activities than the virtual learning program. So for the third research question, which is to what extent are there differences in teachers' perceptions of the cognitive presence between the two programs? Teachers in both learning programs reported a positive level of agreement with the existence of cognitive presence. And based on these findings, it could be determined that both groups of teachers may have perceived their students as engaged with course topics and content. An examination of the means for each of the 12 cognitive present survey statements for both learning programs revealed all positive scores with no mean score below the midpoint score of 3.0. Teachers in the remote program reported a statistically significant higher level of agreement regarding the existence of the cognitive presence than those in the virtual. And because a statistically significant difference was found, we can reject the null hypothesis and accept the alternative hypothesis. So to answer the research, to answer the uh, question three, the research question three, there is a statistically significant difference in teachers' perceptions of the cognitive presence between the remote and virtual learning programs. And because a statistically significant difference was found, this finding suggests that the two groups of teachers in this study were not in agreement in their perceptions of the existence of cognitive presence in their online courses. And this result is due to the development again of the online course in the remote program in which teachers design their online, their own content for their online courses and they design their assessment. Whereas teachers in the virtual, they just use a purchased vendor developed online courses that has all pre-designed videos prepared by other um, educators. So it can be determined that teachers perceive higher levels of cognitive presence 
when themselves they've designed their own content and include meaningful, engaging, motivating, authentic, and relevant learning materials, and they just adapt them to meet their students' needs. When teachers use a pre-designed learning content developed by other educators, they lose that human interaction component in their classes. So um, I will keep going to um, address the conclusions and future recommendations. And we'll, keep, we'll, we'll leave the questions and feedback towards the end of the presentation. So the findings of this research has significant implications for online education in high schools. The study also served as a self-reflection in which the teachers reflected on their own online teaching practices. In this study, teachers in the remote reported an overall higher level of agreement regarding the existence of the three presences of the community of inquiry framework than those in the virtual. So these findings indicate that teachers providing instructions in the remote are more likely to perceive a stronger sense of community than teachers providing instruction in the virtual. As a result of this study, considering the three presences, both groups of teachers reported the highest level of agreement with teaching presence, while social presence got the lowest level of agreement and a clear understanding and finding of this study and the studies discussed in this research study about teachers' attitudes and perceptions toward online learning in high schools and others, other like levels, it all has the conclusion that social interaction and online learning are essential. And it's through all the levels in many different variations. Moreover, when teachers carefully design authentic, meaningful, and engaging online learning materials that align with the community of inquiry framework and its three presences, which is the teaching and cognitive and social presence, it is most likely that teaching and learning are to be more effective. So last slide, I would like to speak about the recommendations of future research based on the limitations of my study. So um, at the beginning, the intent of this study was to examine the perspectives of teachers toward only selected aspects of online learning, which is the existence of the three forms of presence of the community of equity framework. And a future research could examine teachers' perceptions towards all aspects of online learning as an instructional method, not just the existence of only the three presences. And since a survey methodology was used in this study, the findings were only based on teachers' self-reported responses. So I did not confirm the extent to which teachers' perception align with actual behaviors within the online classroom. So um, gaining further insight into teachers' successful practices leveraged during the pandemic using qualitative methods such as interviews and observation will provide us with more richer description of teachers' online teaching practices. Another limitation of the study was the low response rate from the um, online survey. And a future research would suggest to enlarge the sample size of teachers, maybe include teachers from uh, other school districts or all high school levels in a county level, or maybe include all levels, not just high schools. A limitation in the study was collecting data in a relatively short time. It was during the summer of the 2021 school year. And a recommendation for, this for the future, it could be to extend the data collection timeframe and not doing 
not do it through the summer, do it when teachers are actually teaching. Additionally, there is a future research that could explore and analyze teachers' professional development for online learning to determine what types of PD contribute to a higher community of inquiry and its three presences. Teachers need to know that many effective teaching strategies developed in their traditional classroom pre-COVID could be used and could be an effective online learning environment with specific adaptation and considerations for the online environment while connecting them to the community of inquiry. They should know that they can adapt their learning models pre-COVID and adapt it to the online environment rather than considering online teaching as a completely new method of delivering instruction. So uh, just to iterate the um, purpose of this study, it was to gain a deeper understanding of how teachers perceive the effectiveness of online learning during the pandemic which may help develop instructional practices that build a sense of community between learners, teachers, and students, as well as among students in an online learning environment that positively affects students' learning engagement and motivation. Comparing the perceptions of the two groups of teachers toward online learning during COVID is critical as teachers in the virtual may benefit from the teachers in the remote and vice versa. And since differences did exist between the two groups of teacher, this is an opportunity to facilitate improvement in the educational experience of high school teachers during and after the pandemic. This study provides insights about online learning that may assist educational leaders and policy makers in making appropriate decisions regarding the implementation of online learning. Further, these insights will help to create a new flexible model for educating students in the future that meets all their needs and ensure equitable educational opportunities for all under almost any condition and emergencies that may happen in the future. Therefore, providing the research results to teachers, instructional designers, district leaders, policymakers, educational technology leaders may contribute to the enrichment and understanding of online teaching. And it will help learn how to improve the online experience for both teachers and students during and even after this health crisis. Transitioning to online learning during COVID was a significant shift for many teachers, especially those teachers who were unfamiliar or were skeptical about the effectiveness of online learning. However, this unexpected shift in K-12 due to COVID has opened many possibilities that may lead to lasting change. Continuing with these practices post-COVID, whether it's just a routine activity or as a way to ensure learning continuity, should any other emergencies occur in the future, will help teachers and students build effective learning environments even at home not just at school, by utilizing the community of inquiry framework and its forms, three forms of presences. Lastly, to the best of my knowledge, this study is the first to examine the perceptions of high school teachers toward online learning during COVID in two online programs that emerged in the response to COVID. And based on the existence of the three forms of presence of the community of inquiry framework, which is the teaching, social, and cognitive. So this knowledge gap highlights the importance of this study and the effectiveness of online learning environment from the perspectives of teachers, not just students. And this concludes my study. 
and I will open it now for any questions, feedback, or just a conversation. Dr. Cassie, I want to start off by saying thank you. Thank you for considering this to be important enough to research. You and I were start were talking a little bit before the the you know the presentation began. And, and we were talking about how we will look back years from now and then examine uh, a whole group of students, you know, worldwide into I don't know how many hundreds of thousands who were negatively affected by this two year interruption and even from uh, educators somewhat confusion <laughs> um, mm -hmm. that was not to students best benefit. Um, and as a result, you know, there are going to be lots of gaps in some of our students' uh, previous education that will unfortunately prevent them from um, being on grade level, uh, you know, once they uh, sort of get out of this, although it feels like we're finally getting out of this. But anyway, you can, um, you, uh, if you want to stop sharing your screen so that you can be free uh, on your screen, you're welcome to do that. I'll make sure I share, you know, your personal information when we send it around um, with the recording. But Dr. Cassie, I had a couple of, um, of questions uh, because I am actually, um, you know, an educator by, by profession. Uh, I taught in the elementary eds uh, pro, uh, grades and then also um, up through middle school, and I've worked with the high school students in summer reading programs, so most of my background was always literacy. Um, but, and of course, the, you know, the power of technology. Um, I never had computers or had that kind of stuff when I was in school. I never learned it that way. And now students uh, in today's world has a tremendous amount of technology that can be used to promote learning. And I know, you know, it's referred to as educational technology, like you mentioned, and it's such a powerful area that I believe is so forgotten or neglected or not attended to, you know, and especially with, with children who are growing up in a world where they're given an iPad already at two years wow. old and they're learning how to play with it. And then they go into a classroom that is still 1950s in terms of, pick, of learning te techniques um, with teachers writing on, you know, whiteboards and stuff like that. And, and we forget about the power of technology. So it's almost like they sometimes go backwards in time when they go into our classrooms and then leave our classrooms and go back out into the real world, which is actually very technology rich. I understand for technology to be effective, the teacher has to also be competent in technology. And sometimes not all of our teachers are uh, teacher, I mean, are technology proficient. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they have been a kindergarten teacher and they have all their materials in their classroom and they're used to doing these centers and activities and et cetera live. And they didn't have to learn how to use technology to do their job. But then all of a sudden the pandemic happened, like you said, um, and now they had to go do this. Now people were having to teach kindergarten lessons through a virtual experience like we did, to, like we're doing now with kindergartners that are sitting somewhere in somebody's home, hopefully with an adult, um, and trying to coordinate that among 20, 30 other uh, students and families who are trying to log in and who also have technological difficulty or technological barriers themselves. Um, and how, how all of this sort of uh, perfect storm created the scenario where through your community of inquiry research, we were able to see that different types of learning options, one being the remote and one being the virtual, with the remote being more uh, teacher guided and teacher driven and involvement, and the virtual being more of this sort of preloaded buy it off the shelf it's sort of all these you know modules and and videos and stuff it's not the teacher necessarily and how those different modalities although we had to use something because no one could be in the classroom what was the effectiveness of those two different modalities in terms of the community of inquiry and in particular the three presences that you talked about and i uh, i like how you that you are talking about this topic in general because it's very popular and important in the field of education, these concepts of presence, uh -huh. teaching presence, the social presence, and the cognitive presence. And, and all three have to be present for yes. it to be maximally effective. But we were seeing 
um, through some of your research, and I know I'm not going to re remember all the details perfectly, but I know that social presence was the least yes. in both of them. Uh, yeah, so, which makes sense because if, you know, the social part is the social part. And yeah. if I'm not interacting with you, you start off in the very beginning talking about interactions. It's all about interactions between mm -hmm. student and teacher, teaching interactions, cognitive interactions, social interactions, right? And yes. we think that teachers get the teaching presence part easily. Yeah. That they went to school to be a teacher. They know the machinery and the technology of, of, of teaching, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's the social part that we weren't prepared for maybe as much in the virtual remote, uh, you know, online yeah. world. Um, especially for the younger students, maybe for adults in the college, it was less disruptive because they can be more independent and they might mm -hmm. become less frustrated as easily than a student who is K-12 and parents are gone at work because they're, you know, and now they're having to do this stuff on their own. So the, almost the tragedies of what will happen to our, our children um, well, we won't know yet still, but, but the most important thing I believe is how to use this information. And you mentioned it towards ongoing professional development, mm -hmm. knowing that these types of remote and virtual and et cetera, are probably not going away. Even if the pandemic does, yes. these options have been embraced by some people and they'll just keep them. I never want to go back to the school environment anymore. I always will use the online options and some teachers and families, I mean, some um, families and students will choose that. The point is that once they get into whichever modality they are, there has to be attention to the community of inquiry. There has to be mm -hmm. attention to these presences that exist that optimize learning. And each of these modalities have different levels of presence. And mm -hmm. just being aware of the different levels allows you to then address the different levels so that hopefully you're addressing them equally. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I do sort of have a... Uh, you know, some points of reflection here. And you did talk about that where you were saying, would it be different if I interviewed teachers in a different in a different grade level, maybe in the more elementary, yeah. you know, and et cetera. But but at the same time, I, I am always curious, was there a finding that you thought was surprising? Was there something to you that you thought, wow, I didn't expect that finding? No, actually, it wasn't surprising because when uh, COVID hit, I was the person appointed to support the teachers who are doing the virtual. So um, hearing all their complaints and how students are engaged, not unengaged and not motivated to do the modules that they need to do in the online environment made us reflect and like why we did expect them not to because you're giving the student the option to move as they independently on the teaching models. There's no face-to-face, uh, -face, there's no check-ins, there's no immediate feedback. All of these components were not existing. So I did expect that the virtual module learning program will have less social interactive perceived by the teachers. And even if we do students surveys, it's the same because we'll, we will hear it from both teachers. But teachers in the remote, they do have those synchronous interactions. They do meet at least once a week with their students. They do have scheduled time when they can see their facial expressions and immediate feedback. So when I did the survey, I was expecting these results, that the social will be the lowest for both, because like it's not a surprising finding. And teaching, like you said, teachers are used to teaching. They will provide the feedback as the highest that they were existing as teachers, but still all the components were lower for virtual than the remote. And that was expected. Well, and you started off in some of your lit review talking about Vygotsky. And so his whole concept of social learning theory, uh -huh. and zone of proximal development, where you need to have a more able mentor who's a little at the next level above you in order for you to move quickly through you know, progression as opposed to trying to learn stuff on your own. He uh -huh. would have probably predicted the same, although computers didn't exist when he was uh, doing his theories, but he probably would have predicted the same that because of the lack of the social interactions that were taking place in those then the social learning theory 
doesn't work as well when you don't have everything uh -huh. working like it's supposed to. And so without this more able mentor, without this more able person in your zone of proximal development to pull you through, which exists in the remote, but not the virtual, uh -huh. then the remote outperformed the virtual, um, at least in that characteristic, even though it was still low, they, they had yeah. more social presence in the, ver in the remote than they did in the virtual. You yeah. know, one interesting thing, Shireen, that you'll have to eventually do, to, to, the, the real question will be, how did it impact student outcomes? You know, how yeah. did students perform better? So you may say there's more presence and less presence of this and that, but it may not have made a difference to the students at all. They may have learned actually better in the virtual than they did the remote. I'm making this up, you know, we, uh, yeah. we think the remote will probably be better because it's a real person who can monitor your progress. Um, but um, the interesting thing is, does it really make a difference to student learning? Uh -huh. That's a follow up question. But you have you have a tremendous access to uh, students and research opportunities. I mean, for you to start off saying you had 53,000 students and 680 something teachers, I thought, whoa, man, yeah. your, your data is so rich. I know it got down to like about 100 teachers in 96 or whatever, um, but that still is not a bad turnout. That still is uh -huh. pretty good. Yeah, a during a pandemic and summer, it wasn't bad. My methodologist said that's a healthy number. He yeah. wasn't expecting more than 5% in the summer after teachers being super tired and exhausted. That was not bad. Well, and I want to say I really think you did an exceptional job on your methodological design and your research. And so you just laid that out so beautifully as you described it, that it was easy to follow along and understand what you were researching and all the concepts and, and, and so forth. Maybe it was sometimes easier for me because I, I have an education background, but it was very um, enjoyable for me to hear these concepts tied together. But within this new world, I've never heard it done within the online. You uh -huh. always talk about these within a normal classroom. And now you had the opportunity, which we even talked about a little bit before the presentation, um, where you said this wasn't even your original dissertation topic. But uh -huh. because the pandemic happened, it presented itself with a very unique opportunity that you just couldn't pass up. Yeah. Yeah. It was well, great. Continue to explore this topic because, again, you're in a position where you can make a change. You can actually influence these results in your own uh, you know, scope of influence that, that you have within school districts and, and et cetera, because you consult oh. them. So mm -hmm. you can do, you can really impact student learning. Dr. Katz, have a good rest of your day. Thank Take you. Care. Thanks for attending. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.